Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hananiga High School. Today, I'm Brian Brown, and today we'll be looking at section 20.4, dealing with calculating EMF under standard conditions. Now, a similar idea to what we're looking at with electron flow is to take a look at and think about what's happening with water and its potential energy. Remember, water falls because gravity pulls it downward, and it's moving from an area of higher potential energy to lower potential energy. So water is only going to spontaneously flow one way from that higher potential energy to lower potential energy situation. Likewise, electrons are only going to flow in one direction. They're only going to flow spontaneously. I should say they only flow in one direction spontaneously. Um, when you're moving from a area of higher potential energy to an area of lower potential energy from a potential energy point of view in our redox reaction. So not all redox reactions are going to be spontaneous. Some redox reactions require energy to occur. Those are known as electrolytic cells. But when we're talking about voltaic or galvanic cells, those are situations where we're going to get a spontaneous flow of electrons. Now in class, we're going to take a look at a movie, or you can watch this online if you want. But first thing we're going to talk about is electromotive force, or EMF. Now the potential difference between the anode and a cathode, just like the potential difference between the top and the bottom of the waterfall, is going to deal with the energy involved in the reaction, in this case in the redox reaction. So this difference in potential energy between the anode and the cathode is known as the electromotive force or EMF. Now electromotive means causing electron motion. So it's really the potential energy difference between the two that becomes the driving force that pushes electrons through an external, external circus. It's not like gravity that is allowing water to fall. There has to be a reason we're getting a push of electrons spontaneously through a circuit, and that is the electromotive force, or EMF. Now, it's also called the cell potential. So these are interchangeable ideas, and is designated by E cell. So the cell potential, or EMF, of the cell is always written as E of the cell. Now, a reaction is spontaneous when the cell potential ends up being positive. That's always going to happen when we have a voltaic or galvanic cell. So for voltaic or galvanic cells, the E0 cell is always going to be greater than zero, which means it's always going to be positive. If you do a calculation and you know it's a voltaic cell and you get a negative value, you know you did something wrong. Now, when you're looking at any cell, any reaction, if it ends up positive, you know it's spontaneous. If it doesn't end up positive, if it's negative, you know it's going to be a non-spontaneous reaction. Now, cell potential is measured in a unit of volt, and one volt is one joule per coulomb. And it's really the potential difference required to impart one joule of energy to a charge of one coulomb. Now, one electron is one or 1 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. So when you're looking at one coulomb of charge, I mean, that's a significant number of electrons. So really, a volt is the energy needed to impart, or I should say, is the uh, potential difference needed to impart one joule of energy to a charge of one coulomb. And that's the unit we're using when we measure EMF for cell potentials. Now, cell potential depends on three things. The type of reaction occurring at the anode and cathode, Different reactions have different changes in potential energy. And also the concentration of the reactants and products. That plays a large role. And then finally, temperature can play a role in this. And we look at concentration and temperature differences later when we get into what's called the Nernst equation. Now, in everyday life, we're typically at room temperature, which is going to be 25 degrees Celsius. So unless otherwise noted, pretty much assume in this chapter all reactions are taking place at 25 degrees Celsius. Now, each half cell reaction has a cell potential. Now, by standard convention, the potential associated with each electrode is measured as a standard reduction potential. So when you look these up in the appendix at the back of the book, I believe it's appendix D of the brown LeMay book, um, you'll notice it's called standard reduction potential. So they're all listed as reduction potentials. So standard reduction potential is the standard EMF or E0 subcell. Now, remember not, we talked about this before is when we're under standard conditions. Standard conditions would be one molar concentrations for solutions and one atmosphere pressure for gases. And it doesn't have to, but you'll notice every table that we've got those little knots in, it usually mentions we're at 25 degrees Celsius. But remember, standard state doesn't mean you have to be at 25 degrees Celsius, but it often is with the tables we're looking at. So this is an example of standard reduction potentials like you'd see at the end of the book. 
Now, reduction potentials have to have a method of getting tabulated because what we're looking at is half a reaction. And remember, we can't really have half of a reaction. So what we really have to do is compare all of these to one half reaction. So we let the reactions take place if this other redox reaction is at our other side. And we compare them all to that same exact thing. So these are all actually comparative values. And the value, the, the um, reaction that we're going to, or the half cell that we're going to all compare them to and set at zero is the standard hydrogen electrode, which is sometimes abbreviated SHE. So if one of our electrodes is the hydrogen electrode and we're calculating the potential of the cell, we're comparing it then to something we set at zero and we can use that to calculate and we will look at the movie. It'll explain part of that. So we'll go through that in class a little bit. Um, we end up then being able to compare everything to that standard hydrogen electrode. So really all of the numbers we look at are listed as reduction reactions. So even if it's an oxidation reaction, you'll notice you're looking at it as a reduction reaction. More about that in a second. And they're all comparative values to the hydrogen electrode. So by definition, the reduction for potential is said to be zero. So this is the reaction we're looking at, 2H plus plus two electrons becoming hydrogen gas at one atmosphere pressure. So we compare everything to this half cell under these conditions. And we use that to then to establish what all of the half cell reduction potentials are for all of the other different reactions. So really they're all compared to one reaction. Another movie we'll watch in class or you can watch online if you want. Now for any redox reaction, the cell potential is at standard conditions and can be found through this equation. So we're assuming one molar, all of our concentrations, one ATM, all of our pressures, and also you'll notice at the back of the book where it room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius. And this is the equation we would use to calculate the E cell. So we would uh, look up the reduction potential for our reduction process. We would look up the reduction potential for our oxidation process. And we would take the reduction value minus the oxidation value. Now, how come we were subtract when we're looking at um, these two? Well, the reason we're subtracting is remember, the oxidation process is not a reduction process. So the values listed are reduction potentials and an oxidation is occurring at the anode. So really what we have to do is make it negative to actually reflect the fact that it's an oxidation reaction, hence the subtraction, and hence the negative. So this means the value is actually the opposite sign of what's listed. So for a voltaic cell, we can write it this way because in a voltaic cell, the reduction is happening at the cathode and the oxidation is happening at the anode. So we can write that as the reduction potential at the cathode minus the reduction potential at the anode. It's really the same thing we were looking at in this previous. We're now just looking at where it's occurring, cathode versus anode. So if you look at where it's occurring in the cell, you know what you're going to subtract from what. So this is our base equation we're going to use to calculate cell potentials. Now, because cell potential is based upon potential energy per unit of charge, that's a ratio of two extensive properties, just like mass and volume are extensive properties, but their ratio is intensive density. Well, the same thing is true with cell potentials. It's an intensive property. It's based on a ratio of two extensive things. So this means we don't multiply the reduction potentials by the number of electrons actually transferred. So we don't have to multiply it out. It doesn't matter on amount. It's not extensive. It's an intensive property. So what would the cell potential be if we're looking at, you know, one mole of Zn, two plus plus two electrons um, making Zn? Well, it's going to be negative 0.76 volts. What would it be if that reaction was happening basically 10 times? It's still negative 0.76 volts. So when you're looking at the reaction, if you notice, oh, my reaction is twice as big, doesn't make any difference. It's still the same cell potential. It's an intensive property. So how do we actually calculate the standard uh, cell potential for a reaction like this one? Remember, we're going to use this base equation, the reduction potential at the cathode minus the reduction potential at the anode. So you need to identify the cathode and the anode and the reactions that are occurring at each of those spots. And remember, we're going to do cathode minus anode every single time. So in the case of the reaction we're looking at here, Let's take a look at this reaction that's happening at the cathode. Now, the reason we're looking at cathode first is remember it was cathode minus anode. 
If we look up in the appendix for Cu2 plus, plus two electrons becoming Cu, we see it has a reduction potential of point positive, 0.34 volts. So at our cathode, this is the reaction occurring, and this is at the reduction potential. Now, this is what's occurring at our anode. Now remember, when we look this up, we're actually looking up the reverse of this. Zn2 plus plus two electrons makes zinc, because we're looking at this as a reduction point of view. So it's reduction potential if you look it up in the back of the book. And remember, it's not going to look this way. It's going to look the flip, the reverse of this. Zn2 plus plus two electrons make zinc. We're going to see that it has a reduction potential of negative 0.76 volts. Now, if we plug that into our equation, cathode minus anode, we're literally going to take 0.34 minus negative 0.76, and we get 1.10 volts. Notice that's exactly what our voltmeter is showing up there, and that's how we can our, calculate this. So that must mean the solutions we're dealing with here are one molar solutions because our voltage equals the voltage under standard conditions. So it must be at room temp and one molar concentrations of everything. Now, what else should we know about reduction potentials? Well, the more positive the reduction potential, the more likely a substance is to be reduced. So this is actually a measure of how likely these things are to be reduced. So between these top two, if I have this potential reaction and that potential reaction, one of those is going to be reduced. Which one is the one that's going to be reduced? That one, the one with the higher reduction potential is the most likely substance to be reduced. And we can use that idea. We'll look more at that in a second. So therefore, the reaction with a higher reduction potential will always be reduced. And remember, red cat reduction takes place at the cathode. That means that substance is going to be at the cathode. And that means the reaction with the lower reduction potential is always going to be the one that's oxidized. So if I have a reaction, I just know the two substances involved, but I don't know which one's going to be oxidized or which one's going to be reduced. So that's really all I know. I can actually look up the reduction potentials for the two reactions to determine which one is going to be occurring at the anode, and the one that's oxidized, the one with the lower reduction potential will be occurring at the anode, and which reaction is going to be happening at the cathode. Remember, the one with the higher reduction potential is the one that's going to be reduced, and that's going to be at the cathode. So if I just know the substances involved, if I'm going to have a spontaneous reaction involving those two things, I can actually figure out exactly what has to be happening, where, and what the balanced redox reaction is going to look at. So if two metals, aluminum and magnesium, are involved in making a voltaic cell, so I don't know which one's oxidized and which one's reduced, how do I know what the cell is going to look like? Well, remember, it's got to be a voltaic cell, which means it has to be spontaneous. Now, there's two possible reactions here. We could have aluminum 3 plus become aluminum. That's one reduction potential. And we could have magnesium 2 plus becoming magnesium. That's another reduction potential. Remember, the one with the more positive reduction potential will be reduced. So that tells us that what's going to be occurring at the cathode will be the aluminum. So aluminum, as the more positive reduction potential, is going to be the one that's reduced, and that's going to be occurring at the cathode. So that's our reduction reaction. And magnesium will therefore be oxidized. So that's going to be occurring at the anode. And it's not going to be this reaction. Remember, it's going to be the inverse of that reaction. So really what's going to be happening is we're going to have Mg being oxidized to Mg2+. Plus plus two electrons. So that's actually the reaction that's taking place is aluminum three plus is going to aluminum and Mg is going to Mg two plus. If we're going to have a spontaneous reaction, that has to be how it is. Now, there's a table in your book that deals with strengths of oxidizing agents and strengths of reducing agents. You need to have a, a working knowledge of some of the things that this table tells us. Now, the, the strongest oxidizers, those things that are most likely to cause oxidation, are the ones that are going to have the most positive reduction potential. The ones that are the strongest reducers are the ones that are going to have the most negative reduction potentials. So if you look at this increasing strength of oxidation up the left-hand side, so this substance right here is going to be F2, since it's top of our list here, the strongest oxidizing agent, that is going to be the one with the most positive reduction potential out of everything on our list. And on the flip side, Li+, plus, that's got the lowest. So that is going to be our strongest reducing agent as lithium metal. Remember, this is looked at as a 
reduction reaction. So if we're talking about reducing agent, oxid, you know, the thing that will be oxidized, we have to look at as a lithium metal. So notice this one is called our strongest oxidizing agent, and this one is called our strongest reducing agent. Since Li plus is at the bottom of our list, its product Li would be the strongest reducing agent, the thing most likely to cause a reduction. Now, because the table lists half reactions as reductions, remember, only the substances on the reactant side can be oxidizing agents. So what's on the left are our possible oxidizing agents. Lower down, the less likely you are to be an oxidizing agent. And only the substances on the product side can be reducing agents. So only the things on the blue side here can be reducing agents. And once again, um, the farther down you go, the stronger the reducing agent is, the more likely you are to be a reducing agent and be oxidized. The higher up, the less likely you are to be oxidized. Now, the greater the difference between the two, the greater the voltage that we can get, the more work we can do in a given amount of time. So how do reduction potentials compare to activity series? Because these kind of reactions with electrons, this looks very similar to something we talked about earlier in the year, back in Chapter 4. Well, if you take a look at our reduction potentials here on the left, and our activity series out of chapter four on the right. And we notice some substances. So I'm gonna look at lithium, sodium, aluminum, zinc, iron, copper, and silver. Look at where they're at on the right and look at where they're at on the left. Notice they're in the exact same order, but reverse. Why are they in reverse order? Well, if you think about it, remember, this is reduction potentials over here on the left. And what this was talking about back in chapter four was oxidation reactions. So these are listed as oxidation. That's why they're the exact opposite of each other. We're looking at them as a, you know, their ability to be reduced in one case on the left, and in the other case, their ability to be oxidized. And remember, the better you are at being reduced, or yeah, being reduced, the worse you should be at being oxidized, and vice versa. And that finishes up section 20.4, so that ends our second set of notes.